Don't aim to be the best. Aim to be the only. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Kevin Kelly, a true pioneer in the world of technology and media, here to help us make better sense of our confusing present and to share an admittedly optimistic gaze into the future. In the end, it's only going to be the optimists who are going to shape our culture. So you want to be on the side of the optimists to make your vision possible. Kevin is the co-founder of Wired Magazine, widely recognized as the Bible of the digital age. He's also a renowned futurist, an author, a public speaker, whose insights into the world of technology and its impact on society have been widely sought after and deeply, deeply influential. Over the course of his career, Kevin has authored several seminal books, including Out of Control, The New Biology of Machines, Social Systems and the Economic World, and What Technology Wants. He has also been a prolific writer and commentator on a wide range of subjects related to technology, culture, and society, and has been a regular contributor to publications including The New York Times, The Economist, and Scientific American. In today's conversation, Kevin shares a hopeful vision of the future of technology and how it will continue to transform our lives and transform our world for the better. In addition, we discuss Kevin's latest book, which is called Excellent Advice for Living Wisdom I Wish I'd Known Earlier. And the book, as predicted, is excellent. But before we dive in, this episode is brought to you today by Roka. Now, I get asked constantly about the glasses that I wear on the show. Rich, what are those things that you got on your head? Well, they're Roka. And in my case, right now, I'm wearing the Hamilton frames. I love them. Everything Roka makes is super high performance, incredibly light, great optics. They have a wide array of amazing styles and they just never ever slip off your face. And I'm gonna be sharing a bit more about Roka later, but for now, all you need to know is this is a powerful exchange about where our new world of technology is heading. And my hope is that Kevin's words help brighten how we're thinking about a future that is so rapidly evolving. And above all, helps to prepare all of us for the inevitable changes on the horizon. So without further ado, please enjoy me and Kevin Kelly. Well, Kevin, it's an absolute delight to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this, to coming down. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. And uh, I got to tell you, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit like nervous. My outline is like 10 Mm. miles long. There's just so many things I'd like to talk to you about. I'm sure we'll get to 5% of them today. Um, But I guess my head is is just jumbled with too many ideas, but I can't uh, can't begin without acknowledging this collection of extraordinary books Mm -hmm. that are on the table right now. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see them, this series of three volumes uh, called Vanishing Asia, these beautiful coffee table books chronicling uh, the photographs that you've taken over many decades of Mm -hmm. your experience in in Asia. And we were just chatting before the podcast, uh, you know, kind of going through them. And it's really quite a spectacular kind of, uh, I guess, you know, history of not just um, certain cultures, but also I think in many ways, and I've heard you talk about this, kind of an important document of disappearing, uh, you know, aspects of of these cultures that, you know, are quickly diminishing. And, and part of your motivation being like, I just want to capture these on film before they, you know, they become something of a bygone era. Yeah. So thank you for having me. And it's a real joy to be able to share some of this work and other things that I'm up to, but the Vanishing Asia books that you're talking about have been a 50 year compulsion. I guess really honestly what it was to kind of document these vanishing Mm. ceremonies and traditions that I have witnessed and I've had sort of the pleasure of witnessing in some cases because they are no longer being done, at least the way that they were. And um, I, again, had the privilege of seeing the world at a moment when it was very easy for someone like me with no money to get to these really remote places that had not changed very much. Now they have. Mm-hmm. They're kind of on a future trajectory like the rest of us. Um, so this was my um, passion project to to document these things. And uh, we did a Kickstarter program to um, help make copies of them available. And um, I'm just really glad that I can share it with 
other people who might enjoy them as much as I do. Mm -hmm. So your relationship with Asia goes all the way back to your youth, right? Like yeah. you have cut a very interesting and unique mm. path, uh, sort of you know orthogonal to you know the traditional notions right, right. of what a young person is is meant to do <laughs> in order to be upwardly mobile mm -hmm. and kind of you know headed off into the into the wilderness yeah. with your backpack uh, to explore the world in a very kind of Jack Kerouac yeah. sort of way. Yeah, I, it was very, maybe say, uh, unintentional. I, I didn't have grand plans. I was inspired by the Whole Earth catalog in high school to, it gave me permission to kind of invent my, my life, to invent your own life, that you had permissions because until that moment, I hadn't really met anybody who wasn't following the same, you know, progression of things, high school, college, mm work for a corporation um the idea of being able to do something was really not an alternative the hippies were beginning to kind of pioneer one of those and i said okay i think i see other people that I admire who are going a different direction that means it's possible mm. and i wound up in asia without the faintest clue about what it was or i i never eaten chinese food never held chopsticks it was very parochial at the time and so it kind of just blew my mind in terms of the possibilities and the the otherness and the differences were very very prominent and it was very welcoming and it was very cheap and so i had a home there to explore and that's what i did for my 20s basically yeah so it was an extent it wasn't just taking a gap year you were there for back <laughs> right. and forth for, for, gap, for many years <laughs> yeah, yeah right and then my gap Decade. Um, well, you know, if if they'd had a gap year at that time, if that was a thing, or even an internship, mm -hmm. you know, I would have done that and probably gone back to college. But because there wasn't, I, I dropped out and I roamed around Asia. And I say kind of tongue in cheek that, you know, after a decade or so, I, uh, I gave, I awarded myself an honorary degree in Asian studies. Uh-huh. Because I felt like, okay, I, now I know something. Yeah. But those experiences are, are or, or, or were truly formative in, in your worldview and also in the advice that you now dispense to younger people about what's important, mm. what you should be thinking about, what you shouldn't be concerned yeah. about in terms of pursuing you know, a meaningful life. Yeah, I mean, the way I might reduce it now, all those years of experience and travel, is in your 20s, try and spend some time doing something that looks nothing like success. That's kind of crazy, stupid, weird, orthogonal, unprofitable, um, crazy, um, maybe dangerous. Um, and, and that experience is likely as unsuccessful as it might look then to become the touchstone for mm -hmm. your success later on, it will become really, really important to you if you're able to do that. Yeah, I uh, I did the opposite and, <laughs> and, uh, and regret it deeply. Um, I wish that I had had such a broadening experience in yeah. my youth, especially now in my you know mid to late fifties, looking back thinking, yeah. why didn't I do that, right? But yeah. when you're in that moment and all the social pressure and all yeah, the yeah. messaging that you know, you're on the receiving end of, is 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 sort of incentivizing you to do the opposite. So you really have to, you know, buck you tradition. Do. And yeah. there's a lot of you know parental and social you know pressure that 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 militates yeah, against yeah. this. So it's, it's not really easy, really it's a courageous act. In fact, the more kind of the more successful you are in school, the more there is a kind of outward pressure for you to follow that and, and take advantage of your kind of um your good scores, your good grades. But I actually um my son and my kids went through the same thing, college prep and all this stuff, and they were on their way to college. I went to college, and that was another story. But I were did try to talk them out of it. I and did. <laughs> so, so it's like the kids always do the opposite, right? No, exactly. <laughs> so my, my wife is Chinese, and so she's, uh -huh. you know, education all the way. Yeah. And it's the one thing we disagreed about because I was off to the side saying, you know, you don't really have to go to college. <laughs> right. But here's the thing: is like if if you have uh, an alternative, if you have a program you want to do, if you have a travel, if you have something you want to work on, make it a program for us and we'll support that. But if you don't have that, then you have to go to college. Mm -hmm. And 
to my surprise, all three went to college. And it's like, that would not have been what I would have done. But they yeah. went to college. But after that, um, our son was doing some things. He went to get a job. And I said, look, you need to spend at least a year goofing off and doing nothing. Because you, for your entire life, you've been like getting grades and working hard and all this kind of stuff. And you've graduated. It's like, you have to goof off for a while. And so... He was thinking about getting an MFA in art, and then so he decided to, to get himself his own MFA, to make a little program where he did art for a year and then wrote up a thesis at the end and made a, kind of like a PhD project out of it mm. and gave it to his other art professors at school to read. And so he awarded himself an MFA, which I thought that was exactly what he needed to do. Yeah. And that was so good for him in many, many ways. It's so hard to see when you're at that age how important that sort of goofing off time yeah. is because it does feel like squandered time when your peers are kind of escalating up the corporate yeah. ladder or, or, or what have you. And there's an inherent tension or a conflict between the incentives of our modern developed world, which mm -hmm. are pushing us in a certain direction to become productive and um, you know independent financially and 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 contributory, mm -hmm. but ultimately, you know, and I'm sure you would agree, and you're a product of this, the most interesting people that have the most to contribute are the people that 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 took that, you know, less beaten path right. and went deep into exploration and spent the time in rumination and experience yeah. to come out of it more robust and with uh, a set of of seemingly you know not connected <laughs> skills right, 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 right. that somehow later in life all congeal to make them uh, you know kind of truly the only person who can speak to a certain sure. issue or or an expert in a field that yeah. maybe nobody even thought would be right, a field. Right, right. It's it's really clear right now that the major engine of wealth, and I would also uh, suggest personal happiness, is is um, being able to think different. That's that's the engine, and when we're when we're all connected twenty four hours a day around the world with our little devices, the the true value is being able to think a little differently. That's the source of innovation. That's how you make great things. That's how you make great art, and um, anything that can help you think differently, including AI, which we'll talk about mm -hmm. later, I'm sure. But travel and other experiences. Doing, having, uh, reading different books than other people read. I mean, there's lots of ways to do that, but you want to really cultivate that ability to think differently in a world where everybody's connected together all the time. And so I, I, I would argue, yes, um, zig while everybody's zagging, you mm -hmm. know, and um, try and do something different. And, you know, travel is a tremendously efficient and productive and inexpensive way to do that. And, um, Taking time off, goofing off is another great way to do that. Sabbatical Sabbaths um, is another great way. So there's, that's the assignment really for most people is, mm -hmm. is to have different ideas, to approach things differently. You're gonna need help doing that. Yeah, and I think that we frame this backwards in the sense that when I have enough money or when I retire <laughs> yeah. or when I have the the luxury of time, right, right, right. then I will indulge that you know instinct to, to go see the world right, when right. in truth you know and through your experience it's the it's like when you don't have money and you have right, tons right. of time that's the time to do it and we think oh we can't afford it but right, right. your example and I, I don't know that it's that different today is that there are incredibly cheap ways to do this yeah. you can work when you're there you can work and then go there and right, live, right, right, right. live cheaply and one of the pieces of advice that that I always give to young people that I, that I wish had been given to me when I was younger was have experiences, live lean, so that you can have choices and you know indulge in your creativity and your curiosity. Because uh, this idea that at eighteen or at twenty you're supposed to know <laughs> you know what it is that you're going to do in the world and and lock in on that is absolutely ludicrous. Right. Yeah. There's there's so many th things about that. There was a I think Ralph Potts talked about this story which um, it might have been in the movie, of a guy who's going to Wall Street and he kind of hates Wall Street, whatever, but he's got to make a lot of money. And he was explaining to his friend that he wanted to work for maybe one or two more years so he could have his money, his fortune, whatever it is, and then he could buy a motorcycle and drive it across China. And any, we were just 
we laugh, the travelers laugh, because you could work at McDonald's for a year or half a year and earn enough money to buy a motorcycle and ride across China. It's, it's, it's not yeah. a matter of money. Uh, it's like, it's like, it's the time. And that was the thing that I got traveling when I was younger with very little money at all, was meeting some people on these tours and stuff who had a lot of money and having a guy um, tell me that he envied me because mm -hmm. I was taking my time, you know, I was, I was, I was on the hiking in the Himalayas, right? And, and I was going on and they were on a kind of a forced little thing and very controlled. And it was like, he was saying, I, I wish I could have been you. I wish I did that when I was young. I wish I had that kind of time. And here's he a rich guy. And I was like, oh, I, was like, I get it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> It's yeah. like the rich have money, <laughs> the wealthy have time. And it's much easier to be wealthy than rich because you can control, your, you have time that you're given. And so um, th that's the thing I started to aim for mm -hmm. was that kind of mm -hmm. um, having the wealth of time and control of my time. I'm pretty sure that that story comes from Ralph Potts's book, Vagabonding, and it's lifted out of the movie Wall Street. Yeah, it's Charlie right, right, Sheen right. Say, you know, talking about what he's gonna do when he, when he, when he makes it big, right? Right, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like exactly. you could do that now. You can do that yeah, now, right? Yeah. Well, you know that's that's a, that's a very common trope in our family. My kids sort of have heard it many times, but very you know every couple of years I sit them down. I have three kids, and I say, um, I have a magic wand, and I'm going to give you a billion dollars, but only if you tell me what you're going to do with it. Right? You have, what are you going to do with a billion dollars? And they'll go through the kind of lists. And what they're, maybe they're imagining, they're, they're young adults and stuff. And, you know, I would maybe buy a house or something mm -hmm. and I would go on a trip somewhere and I would have this. And I said, okay, um, the, you haven't built, you haven't spent any of your money yet. <laughs> right? Because <'Cause, laughs> in, in, in six months, that will entirely interest will pay, pay back and you're back with a billion dollars. Now what are you going to do? Oh, well, maybe uh, I'm making something up. Maybe I'll start a little shop selling um Knitwear, or I want to do a little um, daycare center, or whatever it is, and it's like, okay, you don't need a billion dollars for that. Mm -hmm. So this idea, I mean, most people's dreams are not a matter of they're not gated by money; they're gated by other things, and um, it's very clear in, in my own experiences that th that that dream of wanting to work to have the fortune to do it is is, is it, that's a really convoluted and unnecessary way around getting what you want mm -hmm. your dreams to do. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's the byproduct of a culture that we live in that is, you know, sort of pushing this narrative or incentivizing this notion that extreme wealth is the path to happiness, yeah. uh, and that you know material accumulation and uh, and 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 comfort and luxury mm -hmm. are the keys that will unlock that mm -hmm. thing that's missing in your life and yeah. fill that desperate hole in your soul. Uh, and it's only through stories of people who have, you know, explored that to the very, you know, nth degree right, right. and have reported back. That, <laughs> you know, and despite their reporting yeah. back, we still don't believe them, exactly. right? That's how powerful this right, messaging right, 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 is. Right, and, right. You know, I think that it 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 demands you know some some extreme counter programming right. in in the form of you know kind of your experience and the experience of others right, who right. can report back that in fact after you meet your 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 base needs through income, it's yeah. not that money isn't important, um, that it's truly you know experience and broadening your horizons and finding a way to contribute right, right. and 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 link your your life path to some kind of purpose or meaning um that extends beyond your 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 ego and kind of you know self-gratifying yeah, yeah. instincts that you will find the happiness that all those other false promises fail to deliver on yeah it's i've had again the honor and privilege to hang out with some billionaires and um what's remarkable is is that they're still asking themselves what they want to do when they grow up Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, which is good. Which is good, right? Exactly. But it's just saying that that, that their billions actually haven't really helped them do that alone. In fact, it's added another burden. It's become another job. It's another whole set of things that they have to to um, overcome. So, I mean, b b having a billion dollars is something you overcome, and it's a real issue about thinking about your kids and what impact it has on their kids, which is very, very strange in many ways. 
And so, um, I, so, so I've concluded, this is not in my advice book, but this is a piece of advice I have now, which is my advice is if you can all help it, do not earn a billion dollars. <laughs> okay. Please okay, do me a Kevin, favor. I'll try to avoid that. Do not, yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. You'll be much happy. Do not <laughs> earn a billion dollars. Well, the real calculus is, is the money that you're earning creating freedom for you or right. is it creating, you know, a, a, a more, you know, calcified prison for yourself? Exactly, right. Because it can do either of those things. I'm sure yeah, right. there are billionaires who've been fi able to figure out how to, you know, create freedom out of that for themselves. Maybe not, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know that I know any billionaires, but you do. But, yeah. um, you know, if, you're, if your wealth can provide that, then okay. Yeah. But if it's just creating misery for yourself, right, right. then what's the point? Right. And so, so that, that level of getting what you need comes way before a billion dollars is this what I'm sure. saying. It's like, you know, and so at that point of a billion dollars, it is a burden. It is something that really weighs on the people who have it. It's kind of like fame. It's my advice. It was just, you really don't want to be famous either. If you just read any biography about a famous, really famous person, it's another type of imprisonment. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the people who are really, really famous really regret that that is because they have to deal with it all the time. Sure. And it's a, it's a real, um, what's the word again? Uh, hinders, it hinders them in many ways. And so it's not freedom at all. And, I, and it's the same thing. So, so um, you really want to focus on, this is my piece, my favorite piece of advice from the book, which is don't aim to be the best aim to be the only right and that only is where you'll f you'll be much more um satisfied happy you'll probably have enough um and and that is that is the route it's the the billions is another person's success that's that should not be your success it's 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 someone else's movie if you're trying to make a billion dollars you want to go you want to be the star in your own movie sure but Explain that a little bit more because the idea of being the only is an intimidating yes. prospect, right? Like mm -hmm. how do you become the only? The only at what? And yes. I think it, becoming the only at anything, even if it's the most obscure you yeah. know, thing on the planet, does require, again, back to what we were talking yeah. about earlier, you know, kind of being contrarian or cutting against the grain and and, and doing yeah. things a little bit differently. And I, I don't know that everyone is is sort of cut out for that. Yeah. So, so um, first of all, it's, it is a high bar. It is a very, very high bar. And the second thing, in my experience in, in both my own life and looking at other people, it will take most of your life to arrive there. There, there might be the really weird, freakish person who's born and has a clear idea of what they're really great at that nobody else can do. And um, they go for it, but most of us, it's um, it's a long and meandering, winding road with lots of detours and right turns and setbacks and turnarounds and everything else to to arrive there. And you actually don't ever arrive. You're always on that journey of trying to figure out what what it is about yourself that is special and unique. Um, but but it doesn't. Um, and okay, so 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 there is there is a, a paralysis I've seen uh, in young people. It's like I don't know what I'm passionate about. I don't know, and so I can't really start. I can't give my hundred percent until I know what that is. And um, I become convinced um, that the um, the proper way to start is to master something, and in that mastery, that becomes a platform that you begin to kind of move towards. Mm -hmm discovering what it passion is. is a product of action exactly it's not the other way around exactly and so waiting right. around until you're struck with what you're passionate about as a as a precursor to action right. is the way most people think about it right. and that just leads to paralysis right. and like a protracted period of confusion exactly so you you almost and and it doesn't matter where you start because that's not where you're going to be ending and that's true again if you look any remarkable person that you admire they didn't start there they arrived at their and the more kind of distinctive unique special and only they are the more likely they started way away from where they actually discovered what they were good at and so don't doesn't really don't be concerned about where you're starting as long as you're moving forward in that way of really de deliberately trying to get better you'll arrive 
in in your in the right direction. Yeah, I I think age and wisdom really gives you clarity on this perspective. Right. Though, when I look at your life, obviously, when you headed out to Asia at a young age, or you know, even when you were working at the Whole Earth Catalog mm-hmm. and founding Wired, like none of those experiences could have uh, you know created clarity that you would be this no. thought leader and futurist <laughs> and pontificator on you know everything. <laughs> right, right, right. I don't I don't even know how to qualify <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, like right, what right. it is that you do, uh, but what you do is very unique and you yeah. are a one of one, right? right, right and right. all of those experiences assembled to produce this you know, individual who has a certain perspective Mm -hmm. that has value that nobody else has. And, you know, in my own experience, I've done a number of things that have led me to this place, none of which I whiteboarded or predicted or Mm -hmm. kind of scoped out or set as a goal. They're the byproduct of trying different things and failing and all the like. What I find though, is that it's very difficult to penetrate the mindset of a 20 something year old Mm -hmm. person with this, it's that that perspective almost has to be earned. And mm-hmm. an example of that is I had um, Rain Wilson on the podcast like a year ago. He's actually coming back later this week. Who is he? Was he was an actor on that right. show, The Office, whatever? He was like, "20s are for fucking around. Don't even worry about <laughs> yeah, it. What are you guys so stressed out about? <laughs> right, you're right. supposed to be. You're supposed to go out and right, fail. Right, and right, like, right, who right. cares, right. right? And that, like, we shared that video, uh-huh. and it went crazy viral. And it was a pretty close 50-50 split in like how people responded to it. Like oh. people saying I, amen on the one hand and a lot of people being like, you don't understand my life. Yeah, I like can't how dare that. you, yeah. I can't afford this. this. That's a very privileged perspective. And, you know, I would, and, and, and not to be, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to people's right, 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 right. varying, you know, socioeconomic right, conditions, right, right. et cetera. I don't know people, you know, people's lives, but, you know, I think the wisdom of that still holds true, but I think it's my point being that, it, it, you know, for a lot of young people, it's, it's, it's threatening to hear that. It's hard to hear that to like step into the idea that that might be a possibility is, is scary. And it does, you know, you know, require kind of grappling with, with, with certain realities. Um, and so I guess my question is like, is it different now? I mean, we live in a different time yeah, now yeah. than when you did it. Is it harder to do that now? Is it still possible? Like, how would you speak to right. that young person who had kind of a, a you know a strong, visceral, negative reaction to that yeah. type of advice? So, I, I I too am sensitive, and I'm thinking not just of the people in this country, but the people all over the world, sure. say in Asia, where I spend a lot of time, where this is a very real thing, and they have far more constraints on their lives even than say a typical american in terms of their parents and their expectations about what they do and stuff so the way the, the way i would say that is that um as a first pass is that if it is all possible for you the more you can do that the better so so i would say yes there are going to be people whose lives do not allow them that luxury and that's unfortunate mm-hmm. and that's something we would like to change that's something that for me, what prosperity brings, which is that we have more choices. Uh, and, you know, for most of the people in the villages of the Asian countries that I have spent in, they had even fewer options than that. They they were, were if they stayed in the village, they were going to be the farmer. They didn't have any chance to become the only. So, um, so yes, I think it is privilege in that sense. But what we want is we want to spread that privilege around to more people. But if you have any chance to do that, in some ways you're cheating us by not taking advantage of that. That's why you do art. You do art in part for yourself, but also because, because you owe it to us. For that's, that's the deal. And the deal meaning that you're alive and you have this chance and you have a genius that nobody else has. And if you can share that with us, we all benefit. So. So I would say, yes, it, it, it may not be that everybody can take advantage of it, but it's still true to the extent that it is possible for you. Um, it'll be better for you and for the world if you did. We're brought to you today by Roka. Glasses are not something you normally think about as a piece of performance gear, which when you think about it is kind of insane because you can't perform at your best if you can't see. Well, the geniuses at Roka basically rebuild eyewear from the ground up. No matter how active you are or how much you sweat, these things never slip or fall off your face. 
They're super durable. They look awesome. And they've got tons of super classy modern styles to choose from. I've been rocking Rokas for about four years at this point. I love them. I'm a big fan of the Hamilton style in gloss black. That's this frame right here, as well as clear, or I guess they call them vintage on the website. And uh, if you want to try them out for yourself, you can do that right now and unlock 20% off your order with the code RICHROLL at roca.com. Or you can click the link in the description below. Okay, back to the show. Your newest book, Excellent Advice for Living. Um, this is sort of, uh, this is a really interesting book because on the one hand, it's incredibly simple, but mm -hmm. every idea that, that you know, shows up on every page the more you consider these very concise phrases, mm -hmm. the more profound you realize they are. It's almost a tweet storm, yeah. right? This is like a tweet thread in, right. a, in the form of a book, <laughs> right. condensed wisdom over the course of your life, uh, you know, offered up in, in a in very mm -hmm. digestible form. You can open it up to any page and mm -hmm. just, you know, consume one thought and think about it, uh, you know, for the day. So talk a little bit about like, why you decided to write this book mm -hmm. and uh, what your kind of intention for it is. Yeah. Um, so I began the book, not with the idea of making a book, but um, I have been in the habit of writing down bits of wisdom into a little compact proverb of some sort to help me remember it. So I could repeat it to myself. So a, a piece of advice I picked up at Whole Earth, from one of the editors, Ann Herbert, was, um, this was, I don't know, 40 years ago, she said, look, you know, w whenever you are being invited to do something into the future, like to have a meeting, to go speak somewhere, to have coffee with someone, to make a presentation, um, ask yourself, um, what I do if it was tomorrow morning? And that was like, oh man, that was so useful. That was so, so powerful because that's what I would do is I would get an invitation to do something. I said, that's, that's really great. But wait, 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 wait. Um, would I want to do this if it was tomorrow morning? Right. And then- If it's if it's far enough out on the calendar, yeah. like I'll agree to anything. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you, but it'll be soon enough. It'll be tomorrow yeah, morning. Yeah. And you're like, I don't really want to do this. So uh -huh. uh, this future projection was very, very useful. And so I reduce it to that little thing. And I would repeat that to myself. And there was another piece of advice that I learned from, and I don't even remember where, because um, these things come and go, but um, it was that if I lost something in my household and I couldn't find it, and then I finally found it, my flashlight, whatever it was, and I would go to put it back, the piece of advice was, oh, no, no, don't put it back where you found it. Put it back where you first looked for it. Mm. Because that first impulse, next right. time you're going to look for it, that's where I'm going to find it. So I repeat that to myself. And so I decided I was writing these down and then I decided that um, I should keep doing that for my kids because I have three kids and we, our, our style of parenting was based on my experience, which was I didn't really pay much attention to what my parents said. I paid a lot of attention to what they did. So that was our style, which was we didn't preach or even give advice to our kids very much. It was all through what we did. Mm -hmm. And, but <laughs> as writing these things down, there were like a lot of them that I actually wished I had known earlier. So I was like, well, it's time. We should give some of those, write them down and, 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 and give them to the kids. And so that's what I was starting to do. I was starting to write down things, and at first for my son, to um, things that I wished I'd known earlier in these little compact, Mm -hmm. tweetable things. And that's how I began. And I put out 68 of them on my 68th birthday and I shared it with my kids and they loved it. And I then shared it with my greater family and went out from there and it kind of ricocheted around the internet and did its thing. And I was encouraged to do more of them and I kept doing them on my birthday. And then there was a point in which they were kind of scattered all over the place and I thought they needed to be in between covers so they could sure. hand it to a young person. Yeah. And that's the origin. Yeah, it's great. Um, we talked earlier about don't be the best, be the only. That's certainly one entry in here. And I wrote down a couple that kind of, uh, you know, stuck out uh, to me. I mean, they really are like, you know, these just really, they on the surface, like really simple right. thoughts, right? 
don't keep making the same mistakes. Try to make new, new mistakes. mistakes. Like, okay, well, what, what are you actually <laughs> saying there, right? Like, we should go make mistakes. mistakes. Like, yeah. you have permission to fail and you should fail. Um, it's only problematic when you keep doing the, the same, same thing mistake. over and right. over and over again, right? Right. Um, I love this other one. Productivity is often a distraction. Don't aim for better ways to get through your tasks as quickly as possible. Instead, aim for better tasks that you never want to stop doing. Right. And that's something, again, I took me a long time to kind of realize that because you'd read all these product, productivity books and stuff, you're getting things done and all that kind of stuff. But no, no, actually, what makes me happy is, is spending an inordinate amount of times, things mm. um, never getting done. So I, I make one piece of art every day. I did that for last you're year. Sh this year. You're sharing the, the AI art that you share. I'm on now doing every AI art, uh -huh. but I'm but I spend an incredible amount of time. It's like I'm not trying to reduce the amount of time. I'm trying to increase the amount of time I spend that because I just enjoy it so much. Right. Um, another one is, uh, and this gets into kind of segueing into the the broader picture of who you are. Uh, over the long term, the future is decided by optimists. Yes. To be an optimist you don't have to ignore the multitude of problems we create. You just have to imagine how much our ability to solve problems improves. Right. So, you know, this gets at the heart, uh, you know, kind of the core of like who you are as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're many things, but most notably, you know, sort of the reductionist term that gets associated with you is futurist. I don't know how mm -hmm. you feel about that. Um, but uh, you know that is the thing. Like you have this capacity to um, communicate and understand the present moment and how it relates right. to the near and and short term future, and you have the facility to kind of communicate around that. That that is rare and I think instructive. Um, but I think you know, as we've already demonstrated, it's it's broader than that because you have lived this very broad life. Mm -hmm. You know, well traveled, deeply considered, um, clearly somebody who who has devoted copious amount of time to pondering questions, big and small, uh, and 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 from that, you know, extracting what the short and long term future will hold and how to deploy our our attention, what we should be worried about, thinking about what we shouldn't be worried about, et cetera, all of which you know, is, is sort of condensed and consolidated in this latest book. Um, but the overarching theme to all of this is this unbridled optimism. Mm. And, and this is something that I personally struggle with, mm. especially in our, in our very current moment where things you know, seem to be happening quite rapidly. And you know, from my perspective, at times spinning a little bit out of control. So, Talk me through your perspective mm. of the, let's talk about the current moment first before we get into future casting. Sure, like sure, how are you sure. making sense of what yeah, is actually yeah. happening right now? We're right, 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 you know, in this moment of chat GPT-4 being introduced to the world mm -hmm. and, and there's a global conversation um, that's occurring, you know, at a very broad level around artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, what mm -hmm. it means, what it portends. You know what it's what it's doing for us, yeah. what our fears are, et cetera. So, you know, where where are you at with all this? Yeah. So, um, I, I I think you're right to kind of pinpoint the optimism as a pivot, and I think um, I would say that I am generally by temperament genetically proposed to you know to be optimistic, but that actually I have actually. Um, but also think optimism is something you can learn, particularly as a child. And I have actually um, deliberately um, become even more optimistic as I get older. And um, where does that come? As I said, there's a natural temperament, but it comes from other places. Um, I don't spend much time trying to predict the future. I am trying to predict the present just to figure out what exactly is happening mm. going on right now and to really look at that. And, and and I think that's half of the half of the president is just getting this understanding of what's happening right now, and um, but I but I have noticed over time that um, optimistic views tended to be more correct than not. So the the people who like if so the more I became interested in the future, the more I would read the past and become interested in history, which I hated in high school. I just had no interest. 
whatsoever. I was turned off by it. I just didn't see it. But as I started to travel more, as I started to have to uh, work in the technology, which was changing so fast, the more interesting, I, the more interested I, I became in history, and the more I read it. And now I just mostly read history. And what I get from that, and my own experiences traveling in these unde uh, undeveloped and developing um, places, was the acknowledgement of progress, acknowledging that there actually has indeed been progress, material progress as well as moral progress over time. And that when we when people talk about the this current time and the craziness of it, I have to say, you can only say that if you have no idea of history and how crazy things, how crazy politics were in the US, say in the 1890s or whatever. It was, we just, it, it's almost beyond belief. I mean, think about the fact that there was a vice president who shot his political opponent. It was like, and then went right, back. like dueling, yeah, like it, Hamilton. It was and, like, that's yeah. like, <laughs> it's that's kind of insane. totally, you know, I mean, <laughs> and we disagreed to the point that we were killing each other during the Civil War. So, so in that sense, if you, History gives you a little bit more perspective to the current problem. That's all I'm saying. It puts it into perspective to say, well, actually, we've had periods like that in the past and what happened. So um, that sense of history and progress, I think, informs a lot of how I look at things. And um, that's a, a fundamental um, orientation. So, so the little heuristic that I have that I play in my head which is that if we can create 1% more than we destroy every year, then we can have progress because that 1% can accumulate. That's the genius of compounded interest. If you can have 1% betterment, so 1%, if we can be 1% better than we are bad, that's all we need. And that little tiny bit is kind of invisible in the world. 1% difference in betterment, it, you know, it means like 49.5% of everything is crap and terrible and maybe harmful. So it's really hard to see that little difference of, of 1%, but we can see it in retrospect if we look behind. And I had the privilege of being in a time machine and going back to the behind, going back to where we were and really living there in a feudal time with feudal relationships and feudal technology and very little. And so I know deep down where we've come from and what, how far we've come. And that sense of like, well, here's what we get. Yeah, we got some new problems, but man, we also have some new th good things. And it's mm -hmm. so much easier for us to imagine going forward the problems and all the ways in which it doesn't work. That's entropy. It's harder to imagine the one or two ways things do work the way things work are much more improbable than the way things break. That's, again, that's the rule of entropy. That's the second law of thermodynamics that's never been broken, which is that the ways, the, the ways in which things cannot work and degrade are far, far vaster than the few ways that it can work because things that work are more improbable. And part of what we want to be is we want to be improbable beings. Another way we could say, of like, don't be the best, be the only, is be the most improbable person possible. Hmm. Okay, and so that improbability is biased to things breaking down, to there being more, more ways that we can imagine things not working, and the difficulty in trying to imagine ways that do work. And that comes back again to why we should be optimistic, which is that because it's so hard to... Um, to make things that work, they really work inadvertently. We have to kind of imagine that they could work and to believe that they could work in order to make them work. So there were a bunch of people who saw the Star Trek communicator and said, I want to make that. I want that to, I want that to be real. I believe that that could be real. There are lots of ways in which could not work. And there were many tries, the Newton and others, that failed. Because it was easier to fail than not. That's the general rule. But there were people who really believed that that would work and it'd be good. And so that belief, that imagination of imagining what it is that we want and believing that it's possible, is those are the people who make the things. And so in the end, when we look back, all the good things we have were made by people who 
believed that they were possible and believed that they could be made. And so going forward, that's going to be the same, is, is that it's, um, if we want to have a society that really works and is full of t technology, we need to imagine an optimistic view of it and believe that we can actually uh, reach that. I'm completely with you on the belief that we need to, you know, have a sense that the world can be better and and, mm -hmm. and aim our intentionality and our and our our hard work, you know, in that direction. But on the subject of like the world becoming one percent better, or you know, kind of looking around and seeing, you know, what's happening, is not is is that not a factor of the lens through which you choose to perceive the world? Because you can. You can look at the Star Trek communicator and and then you know uh, you know look at the iPhone et cetera yeah. and celebrate that, or you can look at the accelerating rate of of you know species extinction mm -hmm. and climate degradation mm -hmm. and the widening gap between the haves and the have nots and and the sort of you know to your point about uh, you know understanding history looking at the history of, of past empires and the rise and fall and the, the arc of these and, and to try to identify where, you know, the United States might fall on that arc. You know, it, it, I think you might agree that we perhaps we're on the decline of that. And what does that mean in terms of the global, uh, you know, sort of power structure and mm -hmm. um, where we sit in the world and what we should be focused on and, and whatnot. Like, so, there's a choice of perspective that comes into play here, um, you, you, that you, that yeah. that sort of tempers my sure, you sure. know my my uh, you know ability to just jump on the yeah. optimistic bandwagon. So so you're right, and my perspective is decidedly in this in this respect not American. Sure, there are three hundred fifty. healthy. There are three hundred fifty Americans between China and India alone. There's ten times the number of people increasingly what they think about the world will matter more than what we think about the world. So I, so I look at the world in a kind of a global perspective and I think that's where we're moving to. And that's part of what the US is still struggling with is mm -hmm. this idea that it is a super power and it doesn't want to be, uh, doesn't want to be a globalist. I mean, mm -hmm. this is sort of like the ultimate insult right now, which is crazy to me because look people, this is where we're headed to. We're headed to a planetary economy. We're going to have planetary governance. That's the direction that we have a planetary machine right now. So on average, globally, um, if you do the Obama test, which is I'll let you, you, you you're going to be born at some year in a random assignment of sex and gender and place in society. Where do you want to be? What year do you want to be born in? There's, all, there's not a year in the past. That's a better deal than right now. Mm -hmm. That's the Steven Pinker kind of notion right. of this is the best time to be alive. This is the best time. That's this is the acknowledgement of progress, and so um, yes, there are there are new technologies. The more powerful they are, the more powerful problems they will produce. Right. Explain that a little bit. Like this this idea of fracturing the binary between it, we're either moving towards a utopia <laughs> or a dystopia. Yeah. So that is. And, and by the way, um, almost every single really good science fiction movie about the future is dystopian because they just make greater stories. I mean, the, the, uh -huh. the people writing stories really know how to tell stories and they're mostly about um, this dystopian world. There's very, very few about a, a world that you would want to live in on this planet. And um, that's a problem for us. But that choice of, and then utopias, we, we just... First of all, I don't think they're a good idea. I don't think we'd want to be happy there, and they're impossible. But this idea of no other choice, and I coined a term called protopia, which is this idea that we can have a world that's a little tiny bit better, This going back to the little delta, incrementally a little bit better. We kind of creep towards betterment over time. It's not problem-free. In fact, the problems are the propulsion for progress. And that world of... Um, inching forward where we have new problems as well as new technologies. Um, that's the protopian world. And I think um, that is, uh, a, so is it, that's a more achievable, that's a more achievable destination. Part of that definition is also driven by human agency and choice, right? Of course. That's the thing. Like right. we, are, we are creating this in real time, yes. right? 
I wrote a book called The Inevitable, and the inevitability that I talk about in the book, which is technological inevitability, is that um, things, like once you invent, once a civilization anywhere in the galaxy invents electrical wires and things, they'll begin to invent electric motors. And once, and once they have electrical signals, they'll have radio. So it's like there's a sequence of mm -hmm. things which will inevitably come up. Once you have, you know, uh, electrical networks, you'll have the internet of some sort sooner or later on your planet. Now, and the AI will come. So the AI coming is sort of inevitable, but what's not inevitable is the um, character of the AIs, and they're plural, there are many types, and um, who owns them, how are they governed, is it international or national, is it commercial or non-commercial, is it non-profit, is it open source or closed? There are so many different attributes that we have to decide and can decide and have the choice to decide, and all those choices make tremendous difference to us. So the AIs are coming, but the character of the AIs and the system is, is entirely our choice collectively. So we do have tremendous choices, even in the fact that this stuff at the large scale is inevitable. Mm -hmm. But that choice can only drive so much of the landscape of consequence in the sense that there will always be, especially with these emergent technologies, uh, a landscape of unintended consequences. Yes. And by their very nature, they right. are unintended, despite our best efforts to curtail right. them or to you know, instill them with a certain ethic that we think is sure. going to you know, uh, you know, be the best for right. so humanity. In addition to the unintended negative consequences, there are also in unintended benefits. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what we see happening right now with GPT and the image AI generators and that to me is a thrill, is that lots of things that they're doing, the inventors of them had no idea that they could do. Right, and within 24 hours, yes. there are use cases popping up that nobody thought of. Nobody thought in of. one day. Right, and that's the thing I discovered in researching the history of technology is that the, first of all, several things. One is simultaneous independent invention is the norm because, um, the idea of the heroic inventor is just totally wrong. It's a Hollywood invention. But the idea is 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 that um, ideas and inventions are networks of things. There are many, many parts. And if someone didn't invent it, someone else right behind them would. Which means that um, um, also the inventors of them don't know what they're good for. Mm -hmm. I, I, I tell a story in one of my books about Thomas Edison who was inventor of the phonograph, the wax cylinder, recording things. And he, that evening or day or whatever it was, he made a list of all the things he thought this device would do. And the number one thing, which actually he he did, and, and, and it's um, been, some had been recovered, was to record the last words of the dying for prosperity. So this was, a, this was like a really freaky thing. It was like, oh, in the future, you could hear Aunt Albert talking. Mm -hmm. And he made other ideas, and number 10 down at the bottom was you might be able to use it for music. Right. So he had no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No concept. No of, concept of, of what case. it is. And the only way we are going to figure out these new technologies, particularly as they're complicated, is through use. Mm -hmm. It's through use. We can't think is there's a term I call thinkism. Thinkism is this idea that we can decide and figure out things and, solu and have solutions and solve stuff by thinking about them. But it's action. It's using them. These technologies are so complicated, they have to be used in action for to discover both the plus and minuses. And that's what's happening right now with the AIs is that we've been talking about it for a hundred years, but it's not until we actually use them every day that we begin to see what they're good for and bad for. And so, uh, and, and so this, this uh, idea, there's, there's unintended negatives, but there are also unintended positives as well. Right, so within within days, as we said, of of GPT four going online, there's tweet threads about use cases that nobody thought right. of before. Somebody figured out that uh, you know you could automatically have a lawsuit filed against a robocaller. You right, know, right, right. like these amazing, like very right, like right. you know specific right. small use cases um, that are kind of amazing. You know, writing out in handwritten notes an idea for a website and then right, right. chat GPT, just creating that website Script, in yeah. minutes Code or whatever it, it is. Yep. Um, but also 
We have, you know, Meta launching or, or sort of, uh, you know, introducing mm -hmm. its AI and somehow that immediately finds its way to 4chan when it was right, supposed right. to be guardrailed, I guess, within the ecosystem of Meta. Like, there are these things that humans do, right? Like, right, whether, right, right. whether they're, they're malevolent or just chaos agents, you know, that, right, that, right. that despite our best efforts to guard against, find a way, right? Sure. And so protecting against that causes concern. And I think the, the deeper concern perhaps, or, or, or the thing that, that I think myself and other people mm. find alarming is just the, the pace at which this is mm. happening. It's, it's a dizzying pace, uh, mm. you know, that uh, it's occurring so rapidly that we don't have time to even get our footing before mm -hmm. there's a new announcement and a new leap in technology. Mm -hmm. And that gives us the sense that this is getting away from us mm, okay. a little bit. Yeah, well, it's not getting away from us. It's barely, I mean, if you get into the actual thing, we can unplug these at any time. We can set back. There's very few things that are completely irreversible. And that's one of the myths about AI is somehow it's irreversible that it's going to unleash and then they're going to turn around and kill us. And that's just Hollywood again. It's, it's a good story. But there's no, absolutely no evidence whatsoever in any direction that they're that it's on a runaway exponential curve. In fact, it's the opposite. So, so the idea would be that this exponential curve, we get it going, and it's unstoppable. It becomes kind of a superpower. But if you actually, um, there is no exponential growth in the intelligence part of it. Exponential mm -hmm. growth is in the resources that we consume to make it. So it's actually the inverse of exponential growth. I Meaning it's requiring more and more compute power to produce a little bit of a gain. So the gain is not increasing exponential. The gain is pretty linear, but, but the number of resources required to make that increases exponentially. So it's actually self-limiting in, in that sense right now at this time. Yeah, I mean, we should distinguish between narrow AI, generative AI, and then, you know, the 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 kind of thing, the sexy thing that's that's out there on the horizon, which is, you know, general AI, which, which we're nowhere near at this point. Right. But we're, we're in this uncanny valley in the way these chatbots speak yeah. to us that create the sensation of of you know humanity or some level of consciousness that's truly just an illusion. So, so, so it is. It does. It is unsettling in that. It, in it, that, it, I guess. Yeah. So, so let me acknowledge. Something. It is unsettling. It is moving fast, but um, it's not out of our control. And then, secondly, what we're discovering is 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 more something more fundamental, which is not that this thing is getting so much smarter. It's just that we're realizing that many of the things that we held as being highly elevated to achieve turn out to be fairly mechanical. Right. I can assure most people you're not going to lose your job. You may lose your job description, okay? And, and the task in your job may change. And some of the tasks may go away, but your job is unlikely to go away. So far, I found only one kind of job, of one person, one kind of job who's lost to AI. Everyone else is going to change it. But but we, 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 have, we have time if we pay attention to it. What we don't want to do is to prohibit or outlaw or ban these things because then we don't get to steer. It's only we can only steer these things by using them. Mm -hmm. And so there is a there is a tendency to want to well I want to stop it I want to halt it I want I want I don't want this thing to happen and that means that no no you're no, you're not going to get to steer the people who actually do use it somewhere are going to be the ones steering it because we can only steer it through using it finding out how it works and the the idea of um, general intelligence, uh, artificial general intelligence, I think is 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 again, it's a myth. It's it's not even real. We have no evidence of such a thing, because so far, the kinds of intelligence that we make are very very specific, very very narrow, and we have really no idea how our own brains work. We're just uh, we're just projecting all kinds of things about us, and I think one of the greatest things that the AI are going to help us is to help us become more human and better human. And I'll give you an example, the simplest one, which is um, we train these generative AIs on all the stuff that every, all humans have written, all the content, all the books, all the writing, all the literature. And it's sort of like the average of, of humans. 
Okay, and 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 it turns out that the average human behavior is sort of racist and sexist, right? It's sexist and mean, and like we're outraged. It's like we won't accept that. It has to be better than us. Mm. Okay, we can we can put in ethical moral guidance into these because it's just code. That's pretty easy. The so we can easily code in ethics to these AIs, and we can actually give them better th than us. But the problem is, is that we humans don't know what that looks like. Does it mean like you're woke? Is it like being mm -hmm. super woke? Is it something else? Is it, wh what does that look like to behave better than us or at our best? Where do we get that consensus? Who is the who? Who's the us in this? Who decides who the us is? There are all these questions. But but if we can arise and, and come there, so if this is what, a, the best human or the better human would look like, and then we can code that into it, we could make them. And then we that would help us, ourselves, become better. Because it's like our children would make us better people. Okay, we want our children to be better than us, and so we articulate the best behavior, and they can maybe help us change our behavior. So in the effort to actually try and come up with ethics that are consistent and deep, moral guidance that is, that is elevated for, for us, we have a chance to become better humans. Sure, but that that is a larger problem than I think people <laughs> understand because there is no one, in the same way that there is no monolithic AI, there is no monolithic ethic. There yeah, is no right. one singular value set right. that should drive this. Right. And you know the ethics or, or the values that are important to the creators of a particular AI may not very well match up against the value set or ethics of another group. Right. So that's a difficult problem it is, to solve. It is. It's of a course. huge problem. And those, you know, whatever whatever is instilled into that AI in terms of values and right. ethics is going to dictate results. So right. that's a sticky wicket right. for so, sure. So, so, then, so, so you may you have know. people favoring one over the other. So it's like the old trolley problem for the self driving car. I'm going to use I'm going to use this AI for this and this for this. Well, or? no, it's, it's like okay, <laughs> you have a car. So should the car prioritize the safety of the driver or the pedestrians? Right. I That's mean, we get down to thought experiments right. that are, you know, yeah. Th those are all philosophical like problems. Trolley problems. But now we have to answer them. We can't just mm -hmm. wave our arms and say we don't answer it. We actually have to answer it. And so people will say, no, I'm going to buy the car that 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 prioritizes the safety of the driver mm -hmm. over the passenger. They'll make an answer. The answer is we're going to favor the the safety of the passenger over the pedestrians. Mm -hmm. And you can buy that one because that's our ethics here. So 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 we don't. Again, we have uh, given ourselves a pass. Uh, the kind of the inconsistent uh, ethics and morality that we have when we're driving, because we don't know who we favor, we don't have that luxury with the AIs. We actually have to make a decision, which will force us to understand that our own ethics are very shallow and inconsistent. So we have the better one. And there'll be, as you said, there'll be competing ones. And which ones do people favor? Right. And there are there are regulatory and, and legal issues that are implied by that, yeah. right? Like, yeah. are you really enabled to make that decision that your car gets to favor right. you over the right. pedestrian? Right. Who gets right. to make that decision, exactly. right? Um, that's a problem. I think the other wrinkle here is, is that, that makes people a little unsettled, and maybe you can speak to this, is this notion that the AIs, even as they currently exist, mm. the creators of them, can't tell you how right. the decisions are being arrived at. Right, right, and I right, think right. that that freaks out a lot of people. It does, it does. And if we can't understand that, right. and we're only at the inception right. in terms of the power and capacity of what right. these tools are gonna be able to avail us sure. in, in the coming years, that's disturbing as right, we right. tiptoe towards a more general AI version right, of right, what we're now right, seeing. Right. Yeah, I, I think you're right. This, this sort of unexplainability of the AIs is disturbing. Uh, it's interesting that we aren't as disturbed that the humans that we deal with can't explain things either for some reason, okay? <laughs> we accept that, right? <laughs> well, yeah, we accept reason. that, that's perfectly fine, but I yeah. demand, this is again, going to say, we demand our creations to be better than us, okay? And But but secondly, to, to that point, is there are efforts right now, there's a whole field of AI study called explainable AI to actually have it explain it. And what it does is it uses another AI that's built Mm -hmm. to reach in and to try to explain 
what the AI is doing. Interesting. And that is, of course, the genesis of consciousness. But isn't it so complicated that even should that right. secondary AI succeed at that, the manner in which it would communicate to a human being would be so reductive as to be right. not necessarily even accurate. Right, and that's exactly the same problem the humans have. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? Right. Well, we're all clouded by our emotions oh, and our biases. Of course, and we're going to add, by the way, stuff. just wait till we yeah. add emotions to this, which is right. in the next couple of years, because a lot of people think, though, well, you can't really have emotions until you have consciousness and awareness and stuff. No. Again, emotions is something that's very primitive, like the other things we're discovering. You don't need mm -hmm. very much. Our pets have emotions. We can put, we can put lovingness and being loved and grad all these things into very elementary machines, and they're going to really spook people because it'll be like her. There'll be people who bond to these things um, in an emotional right. way, like Megan. Like Megan. And yeah. so it's it's like, <laughs> it's going to be very, very complicated. But the thing- And yet the optimism within you remains because, undaunted. Because they are like our children. It's like, yes. And we are like gods. Okay, we're going to make these beings that have free will and choices. And we hope that they surprise us with amazingly good stuff. But the price- that we're willing to pay is that they may do something harmful. Okay, that's like you can't really, you can't generate anything really great without that possibility of going the other way. Mm -hmm. and, th and so are we willing to pay the price to unleash these kinds of entities that can actually generate new things? And I think we want to minimize that harm. And so how do we do that with children? We train them, we we instill them with values. We try to have, we try to con, we try to move forward our own values into. It. And so we are going to train them. But we don't want to restrain them and say no, no. Um, the fact that you could do something wrong means that I'm not going to let you have make a choice. I'm not going to let you create anything new. And so that's what we're doing with these machines in order to, in order for them to generate new things that would be useful to us with us. We want to train them. Sure. And so we want to but minimize it. We're not going to eliminate it. I got you. But on this idea that we are the gods, we are unleashing this new technology right. and we are training it and it is learning. What happens when what it is learning is how to self-improve itself mm -hmm. and to do that with extreme exponential rapidity right. to the point that almost instantaneously it becomes the god and we become the subject right. and the notion that we can simply unplug it right. becomes uh, you know, an impossibility. Right. So, so I'm, every, I'm with you all the way except for the exponential part. As I said, there's zero evidence of that. In fact, it's the other way around. It can have thinkism. It, it, it's, it can work in its brain, but it doesn't have what, what it needs, which is what we are gifted with, which is a body to interact with the world and have impact. So yes, it could work in its, in its little mind and go round and round and get a little smarter but it's stuck inside a circuit somewhere to actually have impact, to actually take control, to actually have effect on the world. It actually has to be connected to the world in some ways. It has to But interact. isn't it connected to the world by dint of being, you know, wired into the internet? Th that does, well, what's it going to do? I don't know. Well, I mean, I, what, co what couldn't it do? At well, that I mean, point? It's, it's, it's like it's connected right now. This impact is the fact that other people are reading it. Humans are, 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 translating that into the world they're they're doing it they're they're putting out whatever it is and so in the sense that that it needs us it still mm -hmm. needs us the idea that it can be independent is um is an abstraction that just um it's very it's a fantasy that we can imagine but it it doesn't have any bearing in the actual real world and the same thing with exponential we can imagine exponential growth but there's no evidence at all of anything being exponential in the real world right now. And, and, and to have something uh, that gets smarter and smarter through his own training, to have some effect on the world, it has to do something in the world. Like, what's it going to do? What's, what's this brain going to do? Is it going to, like, there's, you know, it's going to take over the drones. Well, how does it take over the drones? What's the, what's that mechanism? I mean, it's, it's going to, like, 
put itself somewhere. I mean, it's all, it's a fantasy. Right. I mean, it, it, it reminds me of, I think it's, is it Nick Bostrom who has the who, paperclip, the paperclip, the paperclip thought experiment. It's yeah. just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's actually like, it, it is a religious fantasy, this belief that the thing could become like our God. It's like the cargo coat. It's like, well, we're, it's going to solve all our problems. That's the Ray Kurzweil idea. Mm -hmm. it gets it, and then we can solve cancer. Well, the thing about it, that's thinkism. This idea that you could solve cancer by thinking about it, just by reading papers. You could read, you could have the most genius AI in the world right now. And if it read all the papers about cancer that has been published so far, it would not be able to cure cancer. It still needs to do experiments. It would still have to, there's still stuff we don't know. This idea of, so Ray and people like to like to think, and they think, well, if I if you have a really lot of thinking, then it can solve problems. Thinking is one part of solving a problem, and it's probably not the most important part. This idea that you call dumb smartin. Yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another that. that's another problem, which is that these AIs can be really really intelligent in one area and completely idiotic in another. And I think our frustration is going to be like we see with. Chat GPT already is like how can you be so dumb while you're so smart at the same time in another direction, and that's because the engineering maximum is we can't optimize everything. There's always trade-offs. Every organism alive today is not. There's no general purpose superior organism. There's no organism that's better than any other organism mm -hmm. because they're all being trade-offs for particular jobs. And so if you're really really fast, then you're probably not very nimble. If you're really powerful, you're not going to really be efficient. And so there's just trade-offs. And the same thing in, 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 in intelligence. There are a lot of dimensions to it. It's not just a single one. And there's going to be like to be really, really good at translating or image generating. You're probably not going to be good, as good as something else that's made for it over here. And so this idea of a general intelligence, it's, 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 it's ignorance of the fact that we have no idea how our own minds work. We don't even we don't have access. We can't explain ourselves. And and yet we've we've come to understand that we can things can still be useful even though we don't understand mm. them. It's interesting because as somebody who is a techno optimist, yeah. I would think that you would anticipate or expect that general artificial intelligence is an inevitability, but you seem to be saying like this is not possible or in the event that it arises, it's not going to come in the form that we fear. I, I think the picture you want to have in your head of, of thousands of different species of AIs, plural, many of them being created to perform certain functions, like say doing mathematical proofs, which will be amazing to help us do proofs of scientific stuff. Okay, they're going to be engineered to do that and we'll work with them to do that. But the picture... Of, of rather than a kind of a superhuman godlike thing is to think about these as artificial aliens, like Spock. They may even be conscious at some level, but although most times consciousness is a liability, we don't want your self-driving car to be conscious because mm -hmm. it's a distraction. You don't want to be worried yeah, about whether that it's- That consciousness is a liability. It's a liability. You want it to be a, a, like a binary function, yeah. functioning machine. And, 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 and yeah, and these things are, are also not Binary, they're 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 gradations. They're, there's little bits of of things, including consciousness and intelligence. But the way to think of them is like Spock, which is meaning that they can be very very bright about certain things, but they're not human like because they're built on different kind of substrate. And that's their benefit is that they don't think like us. And that's true of the generative ones we see right mm -hmm. now. They can imitate us in a bland way. But that's new, not useful to us, and you, we we detect it. We are already sensitized to it. It's like no, that that sounds like a GPT. That, so I call them the universal personal intern. Right. And you it's embarrassing to release the intern's work. You want to check their work. You want to work with them. They're going to always be available for doing all kinds of things. But it's a it's a cooperation. It's a it's a partnership. It's a they're co-pilots. They're they're interns. They're assistants. And um, we're going to use them like we navigate with a GPS assistant, mm -hmm. a navigator. We have assistant librarian who searches the web for us. Now we have the interns who help us create things. And um, that's the current state. But what we're going to is, is these artificial aliens, which are really smart, but they, they, they aren't 
if they're really, really smart in some dimension, they're unlikely to be smart in another dimension at the same time because it's a trade-off. Because that's engineering. Mm -hmm. You can't opt, you, like what would be like the, what's the super organism on the planet? Organism to beat all the other organisms. It's like, that's the nonsensical question. You were saying, what's the intelligence that would be superior to all intelligences? It's a nonsensical question. Right. I mean, we like to think as human beings that we are the most, uh, you know, adapted, we're, we're the advanced, but, yeah. you know, are we any more adapted to our environment than the cockroach? You know, you've spoken about this, right? right like right. we need to, you know, recalibrate how we think about these things and then apply that mentality to how we're thinking about AI. So in that, you know, kind of uh, strain of thought, would you say that this is a base level, like emergent life form or mm. intelligence? Like, how are you thinking about that in the more kind of like, you know, sci-fi sensibility? Sure, sure. Like is, there is this idea that, you know, we as human beings, like the caterpillar to the butterfly are here to evolve and that the, 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 the evolution, mm. you know, will ultimately be, you, you know, to, to, transform into this new life form at some point, which will not necessarily be carbon-based and maybe silicon-based. So uh, I wrote a book called What Technology Wants, which was primarily trying to ask this question of what are the general directions in the evolution of technology? And just as a spoiler, my view of, my theory of the, my theory of technology is that it's an extension of the same forces that run through evolution in life the same self-organizing forces are working through evolution. And evolution is basically biological life accelerated. That is kind of like, is attempting to create forms that you could not get to with wet tissue. Mm -hmm. So these all these, this space of all possible things that, that you need to have a, a mind help you make. The mind came from wet biology, but can make these things that we could not get to, that the biological evolution would not get to by itself. And so um, what are, what's the general directions? And one of the direct, direct general directions is that we constantly will specialize, that we make the first life as a general purpose um, cell. And now in our own bodies, we have like 52 different specialty cells. We have skeletal cells, heart muscle cells. We've specialized. And mm -hmm. that's the general pattern is you have the first camera that did everything. Now you have specialized cameras high-speed cameras, underwater cameras, infrared cameras, high-speed underwater infrared cameras. We just kind of go, and that, and same thing with uh, cues and AIs, we're gonna have a general kind of general purpose thing, and then we'll make these specialized versions of them over time. Right, like and, the the general, a, or the, the AI as it exists now being a single-celled right. organism as opposed to Trying a to nerve do cell or right, right, right. A, yeah, exactly. And so, um, and, and then the question is, the big question that I have really no opinion about is whether we humans will speciate. And it's very possible that um, with genetic engineering that there will be people, say the Amish, my friends the Amish, who mm -hmm. will decide under no circumstances will I or any of my descendants ever modify their genes. And then you have other people who's like, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to, Give me into that thing. Give me a, right. Know, take take away yeah. my take away the Alzheimer's gene from my and mm -hmm. all my descendants. The Brian Johnsons out there who right. are quantifying themselves to the nth degree. Right. But but I'm mean, removing, you know, really, you know, Parkinson's gene. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have it in me or my kids. Just take it out. And so over time, we might have two different or more species. We don't know. And then the AIs are, again, as I said, artificial aliens. Um, and, and we'll make more of them and they'll work alongside of us. And that's, to me, the reason why I'm optimistic is I believe that there are problems that we have right now, both in science and in business or culture that we, our own minds may not be able to solve. It's like quantum gravity, whatever it is. Maybe our human minds by themselves can't solve that, but working with minds that we make Mm -hmm. We may be able to solve sophisticated interns. Sophisticated interns <laughs> yeah. and co-pilots. We together, we can we can figure out some of these things um, um, to, to to solve. And and that's so I, I look at a future that's filled with thousands of different kinds of AIs 
Maybe there's, maybe we speciate or not, who knows? And um, that that world is, so there's not this sort of one big godlike mm-hmm. AI that's kind of afraid of, but instead we have this, they're like machines. We have, we, we don't have one big machine. We've got a lot of machines and it's like, how do you feel about machines? Well, which machine do you yeah. mean? My dishwasher? The dishwasher or, or the this, car or whatever yeah, it is. Like, how do you feel about AI? Yeah. It'll be completely ridiculous. It's like, well, which AIs are you talking about? Mm-hmm. So I think, um, and, and that kind of a, that's a protopia. <laughs> yeah. That's not utopia, that's a protopia. Right. Protopia, the product of, of human agency and, 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 and innovation uh, with an optimistic bent to it towards progress and you know positive a positive better world the pro comes from proceeding forward the progress prototyping and the pro versus the con mm-hmm. so there's there's lots of of that and um the idea is is that yeah it's it's um it's like now but a little bit tiny better <laughs> right a little bit <laughs> i think there's a, a misguided sense that people could get that that your perspective on technology is is steely and cold, but in fact, it's quite the contrary. I think you have a very profoundly spiritual relationship mm-hmm. to to all of this that I think is fascinating mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that I'd like to explore. And maybe a way into that is is something you mentioned earlier, which is the fallacy of the heroic. Yeah. Single inventor. This idea that you know the Einsteins of the world or mm-hmm. Um, you know, these singular people mm-hmm. that we look to who pioneered certain technologies and and kind of putting the lie to that to that myth and understanding that there are kind of tectonic plates at play here where if that person hadn't done it, there was somebody right on their heels right, that right. could have done it. And the idea that that these sorts of ideas are are kind of percolating in the mm-hmm collective super consciousness mm-hmm. of, of, of humanity and, mm-hmm. and, and maybe even broader than that. So talk a little bit about that because I think this is super interesting. Yeah, so, so there, is, there is scientific evidence and academic evidence that this idea that most inventions, the norm is to be invented at the same time independently by a number of people. And when you look at it, it's kind of shocking the numbers that will come up with of simultaneous inventions in the past and of course, that's why we have a um, patent office today is to kind of adjudicate mm-hmm. that because um, multiple people even even today are inventing the same things. And um, of course, the other thing that's happened recently, I'd say in the last 150 years, is that there's very few single inventors. Almost all great things have teams of people right. necessary at this point. And so... Um, so the sol- cur- solo genius, it's you just, know, idea is it's just yeah. Solo genius, and even the solo villain is a Hollywood trope. This idea of the mm-hmm. person in the cave or on top of the mountain who's got all this technology right. that works on the first time, <laughs> and it's like they're by themselves. It's, <laughs> it's like, come on, you know, right here right. you've got five guys just trying uh-huh. to keep the IT going for this place, and so, um, so that solo thing is just wrong. It's, it's we're a very communal thing, and we're becoming more mutualistic as we go along as a society, we're much more dependent on each other for everything. And that's my idea of the technium, which is that even technologies require other technologies to live and operate. And that that system of all the technologies connected together is has an agenda itself, has a has a impulse or a, uh, a tendency, and that's mm-hmm. the technium. And I think that this idea that, that um, um, it is, a, we're a much more mutualistic Society and technologies are is is um, is important for us to understand, uh, and then one of the I think it works against one of the worries that people have of the rogue villain, the you know the, the individual who can unleash smallpox or a bioengineered weapon or other things, and it's it's the fact that these technologies are becoming more complicated that that actually is even beyond an individual to do. Again, it's a kind of a fantasy idea but in my research um the power of individuals to do harm has actually not increased through technology because the technologies constrain that because they're much more mutualistic and social you just need a lot more people to get things done Mm. so that's again another reason for optimism but i do want to say one thing about the mm, what we'll call it the spiritual 
component of technology. My, um, my understanding of both the origins of life and going through and the unveiling and unrolling of life on this planet and this creation of minds, I think, first of all, that it's happened a zillion times throughout the universe. Other, I mean, I, I take it for granted that there are other planetary civilizations and they have something kind of a similar origins and growth. But that um, uh, the basic, um, the basic trend, the basic arc that we're going through, that we're following, we that we're part of, so that that we're part of something that began at the Big Bang, and is running through us and would go on beyond us, and technology is the kind of current form of that that we're that we're involved in, and what it does, what it gives us, what technology gives us is cosmic technology from the Big Bang through us, is increasing choices and possibilities. I mentioned earlier that, you know, a farmer, the, until a couple hundred years ago, most people didn't have much of a choice about what they did with their mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. They were constrained by the undevelopment to, to be farmers or, or maybe a farmer's wife and to be a mother. And, and those were the only choices that most people for most of human history have had. But we have discovered this new invention called the scientific method, which unleashed a whole bunch of new possibilities that did not exist before. And we're the benefit of that today, you and I. We're doing things that 100 years ago, nobody would think would be a job. No one would think would you could survive on doing. And in the future, there'll be people doing things that we would not believe would be possible today. And, and, and I think... What that means is, is that um, the story I like to tell is, is to imagine uh, Mozart having been born before anyone had invented the piano or the symphony or anything like that. Mm. Say he was born 2,000 years ago. That his, his, his musical genius would be totally lost on us. We would never get to share it. Um, and and that, that's a shame to us and to him. And then there's imagining Van Gogh being born before we invented oil paints or or Hitchcock or Lucas before we invented the cinema. So each one of these is our inventions have enabled that genius to be, um, to flower and to be shared, benefiting both us and them. And that means that today, somewhere in the world, there's a Shakespeare who has been born and she's waiting for us to develop the technologies that would allow her genius to be shared and enjoyed and benefiting us. So we have a moral obligation to keep inventing these things and, and the moral obligation to get the primary technologies of clean water and education and everything else that also enable that. And so for me, we're on a grand journey of trying to open up the possibilities to allow that every person born and yet unborn would have a chance to develop their genius, to become the only, and to share that with us as a benefit. And that's that's the big story that I think we're about. And then, you know, in that process, when people are making things, and they're making something new, and they can seem like they're just worked into the capitalist consumer business of making something new that doesn't work. But in fact, they're taking part in this great arc of trying to open up the possibilities of the universe to the people mm -hmm. on this planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a beautiful sentiment. You can't help but think, well, I have two thoughts. You can't help but think of what genius was lost or squandered right. because the, we, didn't, we had not developed the appropriate outlet right. for right. the expression of that particular right. genius over the course of human history. And then secondarily to that, uh, this notion of, 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 collective consciousness of almost a hive mind, mm -hmm. right? Like we're all participating uh, on some level mm -hmm. in the gestalt of mm -hmm. forward motion in the generation right, of these right. new technologies without really understanding the context or mm -hmm. or the, the broader kind of macro mm -hmm. role that we're playing. We're like ants, like, you know, moving, you know, along right, right, as right. we're digging our ant, you know, ant hill or whatever, but right. we have no awareness of, you know the broader the broader right, game right. at play, and yet it is sort of unfolding naturally as if there was some sort of divine 
plan right, at right, play right. or greater intelligence that we're you know consciously unaware of. Absolutely, and and I would like to add one other spiritual dimension to that. Maybe coming back to the advice book, and that is that um, I think at the heart of my advice is the fact that this long arc, this generative thing of increasing possibilities of this self-organizing dynamic that it has another attribute, which is a, a paradox at its heart. And that for whatever reason, the way the universe kind of works is that it's generous at its foundation in terms of it producing things and its abundance and its improbability. And that generosity is captured in this paradox of our own human situation, which is that the more you give away, the more you get, which makes no logical sense whatsoever, but it's so reliable that you can live your life based mm. on that. And that that sense of, um, of being able to give away, knowing that you'll get it is the foundation of all artistic creation and the best habit to have because you need to produce a lot. You need to give away a lot and keep making things in order to make something great. You have to make a lot of bad stuff. And if you are confident, excuse me, that there's more where that's come from, that you can keep giving that away. And that's how you arrive at your understanding of yourself is that it's, it's, a, it's a generous outpouring and that you can rely on that, that, that you can rely on the fact that people are going to treat you well if you assume the best of them. You can rely on things getting better because we're trusting the future generations. So there is there is a sense in which um, a lot of my advice about how to behave is based on this premise that at the heart of this long arc in history of creating more um, possibilities is is a generosity that we can count on. Sure, and I think that's beautifully articulated, and I'm certainly you know somebody who who has experienced that myself mm -hmm. and would agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I think with respect to the, the piece around innovation and technology, where it becomes sort of problematic or challenging is, is around the idea of whether these innovations are, are extractive or mm -hmm. regenerative or, or sustainable, right? And we have a long history of producing innovations that seem to benefit us, but ultimately long-term are too extractive to be sustainable and are wreaking havoc on our planet and creates this tension between progress and this ticking clock uh, where we are quickly depleting the resources of our planet and not respecting it uh, you know, adequately. And so the question becomes, can we pivot away from extractive technology to you know, at a, at a minimum, sustainable technology, or perhaps more laudably, sure. regenerative technology. So, where do you, you know, where where does your mind sit around how we make that pivot? Because I think we're living in 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 a world in which the systems that we have created have erected um, a misalignment of incentives that drives us towards the extractive model. Yeah, uh, this goes back to I think. We have a lot of choice, we, and particularly in the politics of things. That is a choice that we can make or not make. And I think we have not yet made any technology that we can't make greener, more appropriate. But that's a political will choice. That's a choice. Right. So and technologically, political will is a is a big right. sticky wicket problem. Technologically, we we know what a lot of the solutions are. We there's two kinds of problems in my mind. There's there's the um, tractable problems, problems that we know how to solve, but just have to choose to, and then mm -hmm. problems that we have no idea how to solve. Most of these climate ones are in the first category where we know what most of the solutions are. And so that's just, that's will, a political will of choosing to, to do those, you know? And we, we, we know that if we electrify the current existing energy system, I mean, we, we can consume exactly the same amount of energy, but electrify it, we can uh, reach 50% of our climate goals by electrifying all the stoves, electrifying all vehicles, electrifying all heating, electrifying all transportation, electrifying everything. Just that alone will get us halfway there to the current goals. And so we know how to do that. 
electric mm -hmm. cars, all kinds of heat pumps. And it's the will, the political will to, to do it. So um, I would say that that's a category one problem, which is good because it means that we know how to solve it. Right. We have the technology. We have, we the, have technology. the solutions, we have but the it solutions. almost it makes it more frustrating <laughs> that we can't implement those technologies. Like we're in our own way, right? Because of exactly. the systems that we ourselves have erected right. that are preventing us from taking advantage of of knowledge that's accessible already. Right. And so, one of my bits of advice <laughs> from the book is that you can't reason someone out of a opinion that they didn't reason themselves into. Mm -hmm. So the thing about it that, that we're kind of confronting is that people, unlike say the AIs, are not just very logical. They often, they're very emotional. They, they arrive at things for not logical reasons and um, they inherit views. They have cultural standards and norms that they absorb even unconsciously it's just so, so so we're very 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 complicated and we have to kind of operate um at other levels to to change our minds mm -hmm. and um people who like me who like to think think that if we can change how people think um they'll change their minds but that doesn't <laughs> work very well. No. And we have the <laughs> added, you know, problem of people being motivated by their own self-interest. Yeah. So, again, incentives. Yeah, it, it, yeah it, it, and that's true. That's human nature. We're going to, so, so you have to, um, yeah, you have to make it work. And that's, we're seeing some, some change in electric cars. And so electric cars, the reason is, is that they're just better cars. Forget about everything else. Mm -hmm. They're just superior cars in every way. And, that alone may help them come about and become the norm. Right, but then we have the downstream extractive uh, you know, practices in terms of mining and minerals, et cetera, to create these batteries that, you know, right. it's sort of like for every new solution, there's a new problem yes. that we have to address. Absolutely, and, and, and my protopian viewpoint acknowledges that, that, that most of the problems we have today are caused by the technologies of the past. All the problems that we're gonna make in the future are gonna be made by the technological solutions that we have mm -hmm. today. And so you say, well, you know, what's the point? Well, the point is, is that actually we keep increasing the, the possibilities and choices that we have, okay? That's, that, that's what we get out of it. So I agree with the technological crit critics who say that, that um, um, you know, we, we keep increasing the the number of problems, but um, where I where I differ is I think the solutions to the problems made by technology is not just personal virtue; it's actually new technologies, mm -hmm. who themselves will have new problems. But um, that is the problems that propel. Their problems are just opportunities in disguise. Right. So, I mean, I, theoretically, I'm in agreement with you. I, I get tripped up a little bit by the ticking clock of of yeah environmental degradation like how much time do we actually have to solve these problems before we you know eclipse a certain you know point at which uh you know the 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 global kind of climate crisis becomes so untenable as to be irreversible like that's right. you know we really are up against that right now and so there's a certain urgency to this that um i think needs to cattle prod us out of the theoretical mindset into the the truly practical application mindset. Right. Yes. Um, and and that unfortunately is is going to be a very hand wavy deadline because of our our, our ignorance, particularly at the right. planetary scale. One of the things that we discovered, not just through climate, but um, if you ask any question of the Earth uh, of our society at the level of the planet, the answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I was involved in trying, it was a failed attempt to try and do a survey of all the species on the, our planet because we don't know. We don't know to, a, I don't know, I would say to maybe 50% of what the actual numbers, we, we haven't even identified all the living species on this planet, which is like a, it's like crazy. And so, um, uh, so if you ask any kind of question 
And the one we know about the most is population. And even that, I think we're 10% off either direction. Mm -hmm. and, and we're constantly revising, even now, the projections of our own human population. And um, one of the things I am concerned about is the coming population implosion after we reach our peak. And we don't have agreement on when that is, but it's probably within uh, less than 50 years. And so, um, and that's the thing we know the most about at the planetary scale. And so our ignorance about our own planet, what's going on and what's happening right now is, is phenomenally great. And um, that's one of the first places that we should be working on to, to you know, stabilize the climate. Mm -hmm. Not to mention all of that being exacerbated by uh, a, a denigration in the global conversation yeah. and you know, a sense of, of decorum and how we problem solve right. as we, you know, move towards what could, what many consider to be this post-truth world that's being exacerbated by, you know, algorithm, social media algorithms and information silos that are making communication and problem solving more difficult, which is of course, another unintended consequence of technological innovation. That's right. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we're, 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 we're moving, whether we want to or not, whether we acknowledge or not, to becoming a more planetary society. And that disturbs people both on the left and the right. They go crazy over this idea of a, of a global governance. And um, yet we have a global planetary problem that requires global cooperation. Mm -hmm. This un, not going to happen otherwise. And so... And so that, to me, that's a new phase of our civilization that we're moving into, this planetary wide level of um, whatever it is that we're making. We don't even have names for it. And, and that is um, truly a frontier for us as a species that only happens once in the planet's life when you have this knitting together of a planetary civilization. It only happens for the first time once. And so um, that's what we're moving into. And I think... Um, we don't have good language, good vocabulary. We don't have good notions. We don't have a good role model. Um, it's a truly a frontier. Yeah, but unbridled optimist that you are, right? <laughs> undaunted. It's going to be fantastic. Hope, it's going to be amazing, <laughs> right? Yes. Okay. Because uh, the alternative uh, is what? <laughs> right. Okay. But uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm injecting a little, try to a little realism into this. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to like you know rain on your on your parade. Well, I want to be an optimist. I'm like, Kevin. Not everybody help can me be. No, no, not, not everybody optimist. can be an optimist. Okay, because we're in a speeding car, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And in order to turn, you have to have brakes. There have to be some people who are braking it, who are to, to, to be able to turn. Uh -huh. I. So you're the guy. I'm the engine. It's going to be amazing. I'm the engine, and I think we need to have a really. <laughs> the engine right. has to be more powerful than the brakes to keep uh -huh. going forward. So I'm I'm glad that there are people who are trying to break it because we need them, okay? But my role is to keep making the engine go more powerful as we can go forward. I got you. Okay? Um, I got you. All right, so you're talking about the global sort of conversation that we need to have to solve these big, big problems. I want to... I want to take that down to the very local. You mentioned uh, the Amish earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, this is a community of people uh, that you've spent quite a bit of time with. You're sporting an Amish beard. You're so, did the Amish beard come before your before. immersion in the community? Yes, before. It did. Why yeah. is that? I just, just I, when I grew a beard right after high school. style? I, the mustache just drove me crazy. Uh -huh. I just could stand it. So <laughs> okay. I shaved it off and then I discovered, oh, the Amish do that. Maybe they're my brethren. And that's but, your thing. Um, but then later on, when I became more interested in technology, I became more interested in the technology, I mean, the Amish, and I went to start to visit them. And the first time when I rode my bicycle across the U.S., I would visit them and I was I had one major question, which is how do they decide what technologies to use or not? And it was a, it's a very interesting conversation because they have trouble articulating that it's so culturally kind of embedded that, that they haven't really thought about it mm -hmm. in kind of a curious way. But that was my main question. And I, and I decided that they had some lessons for us outside about 
our own use of technology. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a, a culture that's a mystery box to most, most people. people. Yeah. We look at it and, you know, we're, we're curious. We sort of, you right, know, right, right. glance at it like we're glancing at a, a, a car accident as we're driving down the right, freeway right, right, without right. really understanding what's actually going on. But you have spent a lot of time with these people. Right. And what's fascinating is you've extracted certain principles around living that mm -hmm. are instructive. So talk a little bit about that. From the Amish, you mean? Mm -hmm. So the Amish, um, okay, so, so there's a stereotype of the Amish is they don't use technology, which is incorrect. They use technology, but they have, um, they're very careful in selecting which ones they use. And they're always, not always, but they are gradually changing that mix. And then thirdly, the mix of what the Amish use is really governed parish by parish, sect by sect. Decentralized. It's, it, so, so, so it's not uniform. And the ones that are most liberal, we say, about their use of technology are the ones in the heartland where the Amish kind of were centered and began. And some of the more stricter ones are at the outer edges of, of, of that uh, upstate mm -hmm. New York and, and Indiana. And so... Um, um, so it varies, but the general principle that they use is they have two main criteria for deciding whether to adopt technology in their lives. The first one is, will this technology help me to strengthen my family? And the goal or the, the evidence for that is they want to be able to spend um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, every meal with their children until they leave. That's their goal. So that means they want they have one room schoolhouse nearby, and the kids come back for lunch. It means that the they do business in their farm in the backyard, or they have a little shop in their backyard. Mm -hmm. That's their ideal. And if they have technologies that helps them do that, they'll use it. So I have some old order my, uh, old order Mennonite friends with a horse and buggy, bonnets, suspenders, the whole thing. But they have in their barn in the back they have a CNC milling machine computer-controlled milling machine running on electricity from a diesel, and the 14-year-old girl in the bonnet is running the CNC machine, okay? Because it keeps them on their family. And the second criteria is, does it help uh, and breed our community as a community? So the reason why they have a horse and buggy is that the horse can only go 15 miles in, in any direction. So all their shopping, doctors, whatever it is, it has to happen within 15 miles. Mm -hmm. So they keep everything in that community. The priority, the real focus, uh, the locus of that decision-making is, is it making our community stronger, more interconnected, more intimate, right. or is it fracturing it? Exactly. And so when a new technology comes along, they have Amish early adopters. And they're all usually guys, and they'll have like cell phones. And they'll they're say, like I, beta uh, testers. Uh, I said, yeah. I need a cell phone for my business. <laughs> okay. And so the bishop says, okay, Ivan. Interesting. Okay, Ivan, um, you can have a cell phone, but you've got to keep it um, in the shed. Oh, wait, you can't have it in your house. And um, you have to solar charge it. And we're going to be watching you and your family to see if this is making you stronger as a family man, if this is, if, if you're, and if you're actually more contributing into the community. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, you have to be willing to give it up. Mm. And so Ivan tries it out and um, they say, oh, they discover something about the phone is that his wife uh, wants one because her sister is now been moved away to a place in Indiana and they want to keep the family in touch. So basically the Amish are adopting the flip cell phone. Interesting. Because all the evidence so far has been that it strengthens their ability to have communities um, move apart and live in different areas because their land gets too expensive in one area. And so and the, and the, and the family business is better for that so they can keep in the backyard. So they're saying yes to the cell phone, flip, flip cell phone. Hmm. Now, Ivan has a new smartphone he's wondering about. Right. Like that becomes very, diff very sort of challenging right. quickly because obviously you can go on the internet and perhaps learn right, right. 
more efficient ways of farming that will increase sure. your yields yeah. or yeah. other tools that could help and the bishop make has, the has, community stronger. Right, right. Or you can go down a Twitter Twitter rabbit hole right, right, and right. you know like you know spend all your time staring at your screen and, all of a sudden. And the bishop has heard these arguments, <laughs> and so they have um, they have Amish computers now which are um, computers that um, just do spreadsheets. They, they don't are mm. connected to the internet because they discover that mm, spreadsheets are really handy if you're running a business. Um, and then they have they do have, uh, some of them are experimenting with online where they have like parental controls that are public and shared and whatnot. So they can go to certain sites or they've been using it as public libraries. So I, I've been, I mean, this guy gave me his card for his website, and it's like, if he's making barbecue, um, metal barbecue uh, stuff, I said, an Amish website? And I said, well, I use, I, said, I just get it at the library. I go wow. to the library to pick up my um, mail, whatever it is. So it's out of our home and it's at the public library. So that's one solution. Right. Um, that's fascinating. You know, and, and what comes to mind for me in, in thinking about this, is again, another tension, the tension between the solutions to our biggest problems lying in technological innovations right. and, and really investing in that. And on the other, on the flip side of that, uh, a, a hearkening back to a simpler time. Right, and right. when you think about food systems and the impact of factory farming and monocropping uh -huh. and soil degradation, et cetera, we're seeing this emergent uh, movement around regenerative agriculture, right? Sure. Which is in some ways a, a throwback, right? It is a recognition of a more ancient practice that is that is more beneficial for the planet. Right, right. Um, that, that is kind of exciting in terms of how we're rethinking, right. how we feed the planet, sure, sure. et cetera. Um, I'm not sure it's something that can scale to the level of feeding everybody on the planet but I can't help but think how cultures like the Amish, right. the Mennonites, et cetera, could participate and be at the kind of forefront right, of right. these types of movements. I feel like yeah, they yeah, have yeah. a lot to contribute yeah. in that regard. The Amish are really big in dairy farming because no ordinary with English farmer, they call them, wants to bother. It's just too much effort, too much hand labor. And the Amish still have a lot of big families and the young kids are it's instrumental in their workforce and they're, they're still doing dairy. But I joke with them that um, I think they're going to be among, I think eventually they're going to accept the robot milker, mm. which are amazing and would enable them to continue um, expanding their, their dairy business as the other English farmers to give it up one by one, which is happening very fast because it is very, very labor intensive. So I think that might be, again, a kind of a weird little thing where some high tech stuff in, in AI robotics can help the Amish. Um, there's a thing called precision agriculture that's enabled by AI. So if you imagine kind of like a big tractor with uh, outstretched arms that goes down the rows and rows of lettuces and the um, the there's a camera, camera eyes in all of the little rows and using AI, the tractor, we'll call it, can identify individual lettuce seedlings by number. It can recognize it. Oh, this is uh, your 2152A. I, I was here yesterday mm. and it can give the exact, it can appraise its health, give you the exact amount of water and nutrients or whatever it needs based on that individual seedling using GPS and everything. It remembers it. And so it has millions of these that is tending individually. Wow. That is something the human farmer would love to be able to do, mm -hmm. but can't. And yet this precision agriculture machine, which is being driven by AI, is, and that reduces the amount of, of pesticide or fertilizers and water needed per plant because it's just giving exactly what that plant needs. Interesting. And that's how AI it, it can transform this kind of, of um, agricultural revolution that we want. Yeah, wow. Um, and did you say that that's something that the Amish are interested in? Well, uh, I can't imagine. The Amish are not interested in that. But yeah. The Amish are interested in this milker, the robotic milker. I see, okay. Because that's their main cash right now for most Amish farmers uh -huh. is, is the dairy business because it is um, very labor intensive. It's working with animals which they love 
and it needs the kind of hands-on stuff. But this, the thing about milking cows twice a day, so here's the cows actually decide when they get milked. That's the beauty of it. They're not being forced. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the cows are happier because they decide when they want to relieve and they come in and get milked automatically and move out. That's like, that's, everybody's happy. Cows are happier, there's more milk and the farmer doesn't have to get up at 5 a.m. and go on vacation every once in a while. That's you know, huge. You know what would be better? What's if that? we just all stop drinking milk, <laughs> well, we don't need to. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> that's another, well, that's another that's discussion. That's another thing, yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit. Uh, I, I, I wanna, you're somebody, and again, going from local now back up uh -huh. to global, you're somebody who spent a tremendous amount of time in China, kind of we're coming full mm -hmm. circle here. Um, or in Asia and, and in particular China. You visited right. China many, many times. Mm -hmm. um, My wife is Chinese. Your wife is Chinese. China is very interesting right now. What's happening there? Yeah. And I feel like uh, it's 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 a it's a culture and a place um, that the Western world doesn't fully understand. Mm -hmm. So help me understand what mm -hmm. we need to know about China. <laughs> Um, maybe where our thinking is is sideways on this, mm. what we should be focused on, what we shouldn't be worried about, et cetera. Wow. Um, I mean, it's a big question. That's obviously. a big question. But it's like, like, you know, yeah. China is, uh, you know, is- What should we think about the US? Um, so um, first of all, I would say several things. One is I would have had a more confident answer just three years ago before COVID when I was going, living there constantly. I felt I had a pulse on the- country and I felt that um, right now I feel blind because I haven't been there and things are changing very fast. Since before COVID. Before COVID. I was, I was there right before COVID my last time. And um, um, so something has shifted and, and I don't have a good sense of what that is right now. So I would say, I would kind of preempt with that, that I feel less confident about it. The thing I would say, and it's still true, is that almost anything you can say about China is true somewhere in China, right? I mean, it is mm -hmm. so vast and right. there is it's... more diversity in China than within the US between California and, and Maine. I mean, this is really vast. But one of the things that people don't appreciate that I will, I will mention is that um, part of the genius and greatness of the US was it's built on an immigrant experience of people coming from all over the world, bringing together that mix up and mash up that kind of um, hybrid vigor of produced by having people from many different backgrounds try to contribute and make and be unleashed. And that ha is happening in China and it has been happening, but the immigration is all internal. So you have people mm -hmm. from very disparate, from Yunnan, from Qinghai, from Guilin coming together and they speak indecipherable languages to each other. They're, except they have this common language not English, but Mandarin, but at home, there, there are languages and backgrounds and traditions that are completely foreign to each other. Right. And so they're all coming into cities, the young people, mixing it up and having this immigrant hybrid vigor that we have experienced in the US. And that was really what was going on for a very long time, to, I mean, for the past 10 years. And um, that has been really very, very productive and tremendously energetic. And you have cities like Shenzhen, where most of the stuff that we're using for electronics is made. Shenzhen uh, in the 80s, okay, so that's maybe uh, 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, was a fishing village. And now it's a city bigger than New York City. And it means that every single person in that city, nobody was born there. None of the people in Shenzhen, 13 million, 15 million people were born in Shenzhen. They're all immigrants. They're all mm. coming people out. And it's the youngest city in the world because they're all, everybody's young there. So it's the youngest, hippest city in the world. And they've built brand new opera house and library. It's just, it's a brand new city, the size of New York and the scale of New York that's brand new. So there is, no matter what happens in China politically, there is a momentum and a hustle and an ambition that I don't think is going to be squashed by no matter what happens, uh, whether, whether they overthrow things, I don't know. But um, I'm just saying that there is a huge um, desire, a huge collective 
moving forward that's not going to be stopped. And I don't know where it's going, but I'm saying the the pressure, the volume, the intensity of that is hard to appreciate, but we it's not going to be stopped by mm -hmm. whoever's president or whatever the party's in, in, in power. It can certainly be diminished or demodified, whatever, but it's it's really a billion people on on the march. And we have to kind of acknowledge that. And so um, I think that's one thing I would say. The other thing is I asked a lot of the young people in China constantly um, who their heroes are, what their dream was besides getting rich. And the answer was zero, zero, no heroes and no dreams of what they're going to do. So they're racing at a thousand miles an hour forward but they don't really know where they're going. That's very strange. They don't. What so, do you make of that? So, so I would go into dorm rooms, which in the U.S. would at least have posters of things, some something that they like, that they're hoping for, you know, bands or something cool, whatever, something that would give some idea of what their interests were. There's there, there are none of those in China. I, 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 it means that um, they're ripe for uh, a new religion. There's no holy scripter. There's no constitution. There's no sacred texts. There's nothing to guide them. So, th so that means one is it's a possibility that could be some weird thing, a belief thing that would go through that many people would follow. Um, it means that I think they're hungry for a vision of where they want to go. There's been a whole thing of the China dream now, trying to get it going, but it, I don't know what it is, and I don't, no one else does either. Um, so I would say that that they're ripe for a belief in something bigger than themselves, mm. but they hasn't been articulated yet. Right, and is it your sense that that belief, when when it arises, would sort of challenge the governmental structure, or uh, you know, create a situation that that you know pits the people against? That's if a, we'd have we to make know. a bunch of yeah, different yeah, scenarios, and that could be certainly one of them. It's but here, here's one thing I would say about that: I, I I would ask these young people in the big banquets and stuff. Maybe they'd be drinking a lot, so it's get some honesty. So, like, um, what's one thing that you all agree here on? What's one belief? What's one thing you could all agree on that you want? And and they they said um, almost in unison, stability. Hmm. the cultural revolution and the crazy, the insanity of that is still close to their parents went through it and all kinds of stories all different ways um, that is so vivid it's like we'll take it's like we'll take almost anything but we don't want another revolution right give me a job something stable right. and income. they don't want a revolution hmm. so they're not having a revolution right. yet. No revolution. No revolution. Soon. Yeah, fascinating. Um, yes, it's it's so interesting, and I and, and I appreciate what you had to say about the complexity and 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 diversity of of this you know massive landscape of yeah. a billion people. Um, but I can't help but think of the implications of a talent pool one billion people, yeah. you know, deep. Uh, in a culture in which they've already, you know, outpaced the rest of the world in terms of manufacturing quality, yep, of yep. course, and and you know what comes next with that, and yep. you know so, where where we're going to be in ten, twenty. Yeah, so they years. have they have great power, and they don't yet have a great dream. Mm. I mean, yeah. So anyway, I mean that's true for many countries, but um, China is moving so fast and has such a force and, and a momentum that that could be dangerous or it could be wonderful. Mm -hmm. When you you cast your gaze forward as a as a future as a futurist, yes, with finger okay. quotes, um, what does the world look like twenty years from oh, now? Oh my god, ten gosh. years from now, do you have a sense of that? Like this is your this is your jam, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. So, so <laughs> I, I would say several things. I would say it's going to be more more things will be the same than than change. So I think you know ninety five percent of the world in twenty years from now will look like today, and I think most of the changes are not going to be in the physical world. 
Um, that revolution has already kind of mostly been completed. It'll be much more an intangible thing of how we understand who we are, like this AI stuff, changing our, our beliefs about ourselves and how we connect with each other. So I think it'll be kind of more in the social realm. Um, I think the thing after smartphones are the smart glasses. But I've been saying that for right. way too long. I mean, long. you were a big VR guy, and you you well in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like your been, timeline on that. Yeah, exactly. I've been wrong for you, so long. You've been right about a lot of stuff. <laughs> I would say you you were wrong about that. Yeah, right. So 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 take that. Like you know, I'm just still wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, even lately with Meta's big bet on VR and AR and the metaverse and all of That's that. Right. And then as I'm, soon as chat GPT hit, like nobody yeah. cared about it. Exactly. So, so, so I've been wrong before on that. Um, uh -huh. but that, but that's actually, I mean, that's still my answer about what comes after the smartphone. And, um, I think that, uh, I'm hoping that most gas cars have been replaced and I'm hoping that we have electrified at least the developed countries by then. And I hope that, um, if we're lucky, we may have the very first glimmers of, of fusion, synthetic solar, which is what it is. Um, and um, uh, I, uh, you know, um, other things I'm hoping, again, the general trend to uh, less violence in the world means that there's less um, conflicts overall on average, and that continues in that direction. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, the wild card of, of, of China, but there's always India, which is going to exceed China in a number of, um, mm -hmm. people. And, um, what we're seeing, <laughs> India is the, that's, the diaspora of India is going to be a fundamental thing. As we can see, even in our tech companies in the U S um, the percentage of them being led by, uh, Indian Americans is phenomenal. And, and that may be one of the great uh, exports of India is technical people around the world. Yeah, and so um, I think there's a there's a huge export of of Indian uh, culture as well. Yeah, exactly. Through movies, television, music, right, right. and we saw it at the Oscars this year. And you know, I think right. it's you know that's going to continue. Yeah, the three R's. R R R. Yeah, R R R. You've got to see the song it. And, it's yeah. just an amazing. I, I watch these just to understand. Or the three the three idiots. If you haven't seen that, it's a must see. Mm. One of the biggest all the in Hindi uh, Bollywood movies. So. Um, so, so I would say that would be another thing. I would say maybe, maybe more of an influence of India on on the world stage. Right. What's a pie in the sky idea though that you're playing around with? Like all of those predictions are fairly grounded, I think. But um, what's what's a more harebrained thought that might have occurred to you where you well, think things might go? That that well, yeah. this is again, this is maybe a hope. I'm hoping that we really do have lab grown meat um, uh, available. Uh, animal cell based. I mean, mm -hmm. um, cellular, yeah, cellular, whatever, clean meat. Keep, they keep changing the term. Yeah, whatever it is, that, you know but... what it is. Um, I'm hoping that that is commercially available in many, many different varieties by then. Um, as someone who um, doesn't eat mammals, and so um, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an an inevitability. It's just a it's a cost thing right now. Yeah. the technology exists. It's commercially available right. in restaurants in Singapore in a limited way, it's too expensive, but the technology, like they're they're continuing to iterate on that pretty yeah, yeah. rapidly. And it's just, it's just a matter of scale, I think. Well, in, in theory, but to me, that's a pie in the sky because I'm interested in not just replicating the existing animals, but actually making up whole new super meats. Um, out of out of uh, extinct animals, is well, yeah, that yeah, right. Let's eat the mammoth. <laughs> this goes back to mammoth your, burgers, like your species project, right? Like, right, you, right, yeah, right. you want to you want to have a woolly mammoth burger? Yeah, why not? Oh, man, <laughs> yeah, I'll stick to my plants. Uh, I do think I do think it's it is it is interesting what's happening in that space, and yeah, yeah, there is a, a you know a consumer acclimation uh -huh. uh, phase that we have to go through because people are. Um, I think it, 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 they have a, a certain reaction to that. Yeah, yeah, that I yeah. think over time will 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 go away. But you know, right yeah, now, yeah. Well, I'm, I, ask me. I'm ready for mm -hmm. it, and, I, and I'll pay a little bit extra for it. So I'll be one of the first customers. And I have been trying them in the in the Silicon Valley ones. And oh, have you tasted it? Or I've tasted several, but not not actually the 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 beef or the mammals. I've tasted fish and. Um, cheese milk products mm. but not um the actual meat um 
And and hamburger is easy to do because it doesn't have the structure, but to make a steak is a right. to mix those two is really haven't been able to do so far. But they're working on it, and uh, you know I'm, I'm looking forward to it. A lot of money and a lot of smart people yep. are on that problem. Um, what are the things on that note uh, that you think we're going to look back on? I don't know, fifty years from now, hundred years from now, and just just cringe. Yeah. It may be eating meat might be one of them. Uh, I have another idea, that, which is kind of maybe trivial, but I thought it was very possible, which is that um, it may be embarrassing for us who have names assigned by our parents. <laughs> yes. I I saw the New York Times article yeah, yeah. where you had a list of these things, and that one definitely popped out to me. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's like arranged like... <laughs> marriages. It's like, yeah, of course you're going to choose your own name when you're 16 or whatever it is. Uh-huh. Uh, I wish... We all did that. Um, and the idea that you have a name assigned by your parents, I think is just going to be embarrassing. Right. That's, that's very interesting. I mean, that, I feel like that's a sort of progression or evolution beyond the gender you know, yeah. conversation that we're having right now, right, like right. a natural like, exactly extension right. of that. Yeah. Um, you added to that wrapping food in plastic. That's right. a no-brainer. Um, Getting off the summer from school? Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to be educated around the clock? Why not? I uh -huh. went to this one school <laughs> where the teachers were not allowed to teach you anything uh -huh. except how to learn. So, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, well, you, you should be taking your vacations when you want to rather than just in the summer. Mm -hmm. So, it doesn't mean you have to go to school all year. It just means that you don't yeah. have to take all vacations together. Well, I think these technologies uh, are, are so powerful and our education system is so lagging yeah, right. in terms of acknowledging the power and the capacity for these technologies to revolutionize right. how we learn and what we learn. Like right. we're learning the, the wrong right. things. We're not learning the things we exactly. should be learning. Right. Right. And we're not um, training young people to leverage the best of what technology has to offer in order to really you right. know, right. kind right. of nourish their educations. Right. 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 Exactly. And I have one word, YouTube. <laughs> okay. YouTube is this- That can go both ways. Uh, it's phenomenal, underappreciated the way in which it's accelerating our culture and the role it's playing in education today. And it has great potential to be even more uh, an accelerant. Uh, and I don't think they even know they being at YouTube don't even realize mm -hmm. what they have. And the part of the problem is that unlike a bookstore or a newsstand, we can go in and see what's being covered. There's really no way for anybody encountering it to have any idea of, of its depth and breadth. And it's just this vast ocean that is kind of subterranean and people don't even understand the, the way in which it's um, working on learning and accelerating um, all, every field from brain surgery to of science is mm -hmm. it's really incredible. Yeah, I, I think we're we're ripe to see tons more innovation yeah. in the space of education. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, kind of pivoting back to the advice piece uh, before I let you go, I did want to touch on one last thing, which is this thing that you did a while back, where you lived your life for six months, yeah. uh, as if you were going to die, mm -hmm. and this became the subject of a uh, uh, This American Life mm -hmm. podcast. So explain a little bit about like what you did, why you did it, and and kind of what you learned from that experience. Um, well, first of all, I told the story on one of the first Amer This American Lives, and I'd never told it before. And I've never told it as well since. So I would urge people to go yeah, look for we'll it. We'll link it up in the It's show called Should Have Been Dead. But the 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 um the short version was that I got this assignment after a religious conversion in Jerusalem to live as if I was gonna die in six months. Um, and actually take it seriously. So I suspected, knew as a healthy 20 year old that I wasn't probably gonna die, but I had to really take it and prepare to do it. And that's what I did. And um, it took six months and I was riding my bicycle across to my end date. And I was surrendering the future the entire time, I'm not taking pictures, because who needs pictures in three months? And that um, stripping away of my future was really important because when I didn't, when I was reborn on the next day after the six months, I suddenly had my future before me and I, and I realized how important it was to have a future forward, how, how necessary and humane and how inhumane and torturous it was to be stripped 
of a future. And that kind of instigated my interest in exploring the future and really trying to develop it because I think it's an essential part of being a human being is to have something in front of us. Mm -hmm. Yes, how we contemplate, how we think about the future, how we plan for the future and just conceptualize it really is part and parcel of what makes us human and is part of the motor or the motivation for getting up in the bed, uh, you know, out of bed in the morning and planning how we're going to live. Exactly. Right. And um, we have, in addition to being given these incredible bodies that we're given time and time only moves forward, that is the future. Mm -hmm. And so it's not only do we have this incredible blessing of being able to be put into things that have impact, that we can actually have impact, unlike being intangible beings of light, we have things that we can do and make and get hurt and um, hurt others and help others and build stuff. But we also get the time, we get the arrow of time going forward, knowing that we will have time in a future. And that to me is the great, the great ride that we're on the angels in heaven are weeping to see us squander it. Yes. So take advantage yeah, of it. On the, on the <laughs> subject of squandering it, I mean, I think the human mind is, is you know, uh, oriented around conceptualizing the future in, in the context of self-interest or optimizing uh -huh. self-interest and also isn't great about pondering the future uh, in a long-term sense, but yeah. more in a short-term sense. And, and long-termism, is something you've thought a lot about, right, is right. something you care a lot about, and I think is something that's also percolating up in the culture and becoming a bit of a zeitgeist thing where more and more people are talking about the importance of thinking about and approaching our problems from an extremely you know long lens point of view. Right, it's, it's a, taking the kind of a civilizational scale or a generational scale is what we like to put about it, thinking in terms of generations maybe working on something that might not be finished in your own lifespan, that might require mm -hmm. generations to complete like a cathedral or a road system or something grand like that. And, um, but even beyond those kind of grand plans, what we want to do is to kind of help people like ourselves um, become um, good ancestors to, to actually have, do something so that in the future they may say, hmm, thank you ancestor for yeah. having started that or done that in the way that most of what we surrounded ourselves here has been built by previous generations and we should thank them. So what can we do to be a good ancestor besides plant a tree? Right. And what is the answer to that for you? Um, try Trying to um, increase learning in the world so that we can unleash opportunities for the maximum number of people born and yet unborn so that they can share their genius with us and themselves. Mm, beautiful. I think that's a, a, a great place to land the plane for today. I have a million other things I, I could <laughs> we'll, have talked to you about we'll today. To I'd love to have you back. Uh, sure. In the meantime, excellent advice for living wisdom. I wish I'd known earlier is, uh, is your new book. Everybody check it out. This is like the perfect book to just, you know, basically open to any page and have yep. a thought for the day. Um, I love it. And uh, you're a national treasure. Well, thank you. A global treasure. <laughs> you're an international better, treasure. A cosmic treasure. Okay, yeah, well, thank a cosmic you. cosmic treasure. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you're a gift. I, you're, you're somebody I've, I've I followed you for a very long time. And like I said at the outset, I was nervous to meet you because yeah. um, I've been very invested in the work that you've done for many years. So it, it really was an honor and a gift to have you here to share with me today. It was my thank pleasure. You. I enjoyed every minute. You're a great interviewer. I just love your presence. Thank you for being you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. Cheers. Peace. Yep. Bye. Plants. <laughs>